Google is letting us go pageless in Google Docs. Seesaw has improved how students interact with teacher-created assignments. And Microsoft announced the student-facing reading tool, Reading Coach. Welcome to episode three of the EdTech News Brief. I'm your host, Jake Miller. This is the show where, as the title says, I tell you about the EdTech News and I keep it brief. And by brief, I mean clear, concise, and just what you need to know. Nothing more, nothing less. This is episode three, it's April 20th, and I've got three bits of news to share with you today. Before I get started with those bits of news, though, I'd like to point out that today is the first episode that I am airing both as a podcast and as a YouTube video. In the survey, which I'll share the link to later in the episode, a majority of respondents said they'd be interested in viewing this as a YouTube video, so I'm trying it out today. I hope that you'll consider filling out the survey, if you haven't already, to tell me what you think. And remember, if you respond to the survey before the end of April, you'll be entered to win one of a bunch of crazy prizes, which I will be listing at the end of the show as well. Listen all of the way to the end to hear more about that survey. So if we only print a fraction of the Google Docs that we create, why are our docs formatted for eight and a half by 11 inch paper? And our computer screens aren't eight and a half by 11 inches, so why is that the default? And we could change to other paper sizes, but why paper anyhow? Well, Google finally realized this and offered up a pageless document setting. Just go to File, then Page Setup, and select Pageless to start. You'll notice that your page looks pretty much the same except for the boundary around the page has disappeared. Sure, page breaks will disappear as well as headers and footers and footnotes, keep that in mind, but the width of your text will still fit a typical piece of paper. You'll now want to click View and then Text Width and select a different text width. Then when you change the normal zoom option, you know, the 100%, 90%, 75%, 150%, when you change that normal zoom option that you see in the toolbar, it'll make your text larger without zooming into the page itself. The real benefit here is being able to make tables and images as wide as you like. I think this feature has some room to grow, but I'm really glad to see it added. Are you looking for ways to make teaching and learning more interactive in your classroom? I know I am. Do you ever feel overwhelmed when it comes to integrating technology and content standards? Uh, for me, the technology, no, the content standards, yes, but maybe your answer is different. Are you searching for lessons that you can immediately implement in your learning environment? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> then you are ready to dive into the interactive classroom. In this practical and idea-packed book, co-authors and classroom teachers, Joe and Kristen Merrill, share their personal framework for teaching. As you implement the lessons and strategies, you will define interactive learning and how to use it to instantly transform your learning space, create long-lasting bonds with students and parents that will empower your learners and lead to success both in and out of the classroom. You'll also, as Ross said in Friends, learn to pivot. <laughs> You'll design interactive lessons that foster grit and challenge students to grow. You'll get interactive lessons that you could use in your classroom tomorrow. There are even 100 plus pages of lesson ideas taken right from Kristen and Joe's classroom. That's The Interactive Classroom by Joe and Kristen Merrill. Back in March, Seesaw announced a set of updates that I'm pretty excited about. For those of you not familiar with Seesaw, I often compare it to a combination of an LMS, a digital learning portfolio, and a parent-guardian communication tool. It's most often used by elementary school teachers. Case in point, 29.2% of the people who responded to my podcast survey said they use Seesaw, and of them, 37% of them were pre-K to sixth grade teachers, and 0% of them were 7th to 12th grade teachers. The other 63-ish percent were in other roles like tech coaches and administrators and things like that. Now, I think that's crazy because I think it's great for all ages. Anyhow, I wasn't supposed to bring my soapbox to this podcast, was I? <laughs> well, anyhow, let's talk about the updates to Seesaw. In the past, if you sent an activity to your students, they were able to delete the pages from the template. Now, though, students cannot delete the teacher-created pages, but they can delete pages that they add, which is fine. In a similar vein, students were previously able to unlock parts of the template that the teacher had locked in place. Now that option has been removed. 
Also, previously, students could also reorder the activity pages, typically by accident when scrolling, and this has now also been fixed. As the release says, they have adjusted the sensitivity of the reorder action in the pages menu and disabled page reordering on drag gestures to prevent this issue. Fourth, in the past, there were also problems with students accidentally creating new pages while drawing. They have now fixed that issue as well. And finally, while many activities require students writing or drawing, some involve manipulatives that need to be moved around the screen. Previously, when opening one of these pages, the pen tool was automatically selected and students ended up drawing on the things instead of moving them around. Now, the app intelligently starts with the move tool if there are movable shapes and the pen tool if there are no movable shapes. Last week, I shared quite a bit about the Reading Progress tool in Microsoft. It's a tool for tracking students' reading fluency and supporting their growth. It is, however, mostly a teacher-facing tool. Now, Microsoft has announced the addition of Reading Coach, which your students can use for their own personalized reading practice. After students complete a passage in Reading Progress, Reading Coach steps in to tell them what words they struggled with, and it gives them an opportunity to practice them. In the example in their announcement, the student mispronounces atmosphere as atomosphere. Then, when the student goes back into practice, it shows it to them one syllable at a time and then listens to them making another attempt. Along with identifying these certain tricky words, Reading Coach tells students their accuracy, their correct words per minute, and how long it took them to read a passage. As a teacher, you can select what tools students have available with options including text-to-speech, syllable breaking, and picture dictionary. So for example, when the student goes to practice that word atmosphere, you might not want them to see uh, or hear atmosphere spoken out loud, or you might not want to hear it, them to see it uh, broken down by syllables, or you might not want them to see a picture dictionary. I think you probably do want all of those things, but you as a teacher get to steer what things they do see and what things they don't. Reading Coach will also be available within the Immersive Reader, meaning your students can use it elsewhere on the web. This means this Reading Fluency tool will be paired with the great UDL functionalities of the Immersive Reader. One exciting implication is that this pairs the Microsoft Translator in Immersive Reader with the Reading Coach, meaning that it could be really great for English language learners. The Reading Coach integration in Immersive Reader will be available in Word Online, OneNote, Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Forms, and other Microsoft platforms, and I'm willing to bet it'll go further later, although that's not part of the news release. That's just my guess. Uh, Microsoft expects the Reading Coach to be available this summer. Along with this, they are adding more to reading progress itself. Previously, it measured correct words per minute, accuracy rates, and challenging words. Now they've added a few other features. The first one is called Prosody, uh, which helps students develop their ability to read with expression. So it's looking for, did the student pause for that comma? Did they read that as if it was a question? Were they reading with expression or was it monotone? It'll tell them when they were monotone. It'll tell them when they missed those things like periods, commas, or question marks. And and th those things were kind of difficult to identify prior to the addition of prosody. You were just finding out were they pronouncing words correctly, not was their reading truly fluent, and prosody adds that in. And that's not all. They're also adding the ability to see what phonetic rules students are struggling with. It's kind of like using a program where questions are aligned to standards, except here they are aligned to the phonemes in the words. I should point out that while much of these reading progress offerings is available across a wide range of languages, things like the phonetic rules is currently just in English. So some things are available in, uh, in, a, in excess of 100 languages, while others are only a few, and some of them are still just in English as they roll them out. These reading progress editions are also scheduled to drop this summer, though I have seen it mentioned as late spring in a couple other locations. Okay, so you might have noticed that I referenced the percentage of the EdTech News Brief listeners who use Seesaw earlier. You might have also noticed that I led with the Google item, then the Seesaw item, then ended with the Microsoft item. This is because I know that 91.7% of my listeners are Google users, and 28.6% of my users are Seesaw users, and 12% of the listeners are Microsoft users. You also notice that I mentioned that I'm now launching this as a YouTube video as well, because so many of the people filling out the survey said that they would watch it as a YouTube video. Well, 
This information is coming from just the folks who have filled out the survey, survey. And there's lots of good info in there that helps me provide relevant information to you. Not only does it help me decide, should I offer this as a YouTube video? It helps me decide, should I put the Microsoft item first or the Google item first? Well, clearly we have more Google listeners than Microsoft listeners. Now, maybe that's not accurate. Maybe the Microsoft listeners just haven't filled out the survey or discovered the show yet. So do me a favor and head over to jakemiller.net slash contest survey to fill out that survey. As you know, the more people who fill it out, the more accurate it will be. And of course, you'll be entered to win one of the awesome prizes. Those prizes include a ShakeUp Learning All Access PD Pass, enrollment in all of the Ditch That Textbook courses, one year of Pear Deck Premium, one year of the Book Creator 1000 Book Plan, a blue snowball mic along with one year of Moat Unlimited, one year of the Screencastify Unlimited Pack with the Edit, Record, and Submit Unlimited Plans, two more one year Moat Unlimited winners, two Okio Cam T uh, webcam winners, a school subscription to Wii Video for the rest of this school year, one year of GimKit Pro, one year of Screencast-O-Matic Premiere, a signed copy of my book, Educational Duct Tape, a signed copy of the Microsoft Teams Playbook by Jenny Long and Salih Clark, three winners of one year of Classroom Q, five winners of the Interactive Class by Kristen and Joe Merrill, which you heard about earlier in the show, five winners of a GIF or GIF sticker, preferably GIF, but whatever you pick, five winners of Flipgrid swag, a winner of some Edpuzzle swag, and a winner of some Screencastify swag. That is a lot of prizes, and some of those are really awesome. To enter, head over to jakemiller.net slash contest survey, and then fill out the survey, and then click the link at the end of the survey to fill out the prize entry. That's it. One entry per person. I don't care how many email addresses you have. You still just count as one person. And each person will win a maximum of one prize so we can spread that love around. You can enter until the end of April, and I'll select winners in early May. May. After that, if you've still got some energy, I'd love it if you told your friends about the show. And finally, the way that I'll cap off every episode is with a dad joke because I'm a dad, so why not? Shout out again to Jen Giffen and Kim Polishuk who start their episodes of Shooks and Giff, the podcast with dad jokes. I'm taking the inspiration from them and ending my episodes of the EdTech News Brief with a dad joke. Hope they don't mind. So here's today's. What does a baby computer call his father? Data. <laughs> Get it? Data? <laughs> Good one, data. Data or data? Oh, data wasn't really important for that joke. Got to be damn data. <laughs> Thanks for listening to today's episode. I will most likely be back next Wednesday, and I really hope that you will be too. I'd really appreciate it if you rate, review, and share this episode.